really great to be here and to tell you a short story about something that we're very excited about in the group right now. I direct a neurotechnology group at MIT uh, with the goal of analyzing and controlling complex brain functions to understand how they arise from underlying mechanisms and also to figure out how to repair brain disease states. Now, one of the key reasons why this is so hard is that the brain is a large object. Brain cells are enormous cells, by far the largest cells in the body, centimeters in spatial extent. But if you care about how information is processed, transformed, communicated, those are through nanoscale things. The wiring of the brain, connections between brain cells called synapses. And uh, within the synapses, which we're zooming into right now in this little cartoon, biomolecules, which are, of course, 30,000 genes in the human genome. They encode, uh, encode for tons and tons of biomolecular building blocks. So how the heck do you see something as large as a brain without losing sight of all the mechanisms that are so important? And importantly as well, are the targets for drugs that you build to treat brain diseases. And the other issue that we confront in brain science is time. So if you care about memory or Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease or development or aging, those are long time scale events that take years, sometimes decades. But the quantal building blocks of what goes on in the brain are very brief. These millisecond time scale electrical pulses that brain cells make and the millisecond time scale chemical exchanges that brain cells use to communicate. So in our group, we've been working on three kinds of technology in general. From top to bottom, we've been working on ways to make maps of the brain. How can you go from molecule to entire circuit? Second bullet point, we've been working on ways to control brain activity. Why can't we dial in a pattern of activity and make the brain do what we want, both to understand it or to repair it? And then finally, we work on ways to image the high-speed electrical dynamics of the brain. Today, I'm not going to talk to you about all three of these things. Um, I'll just allude to the later two. We've developed a technology that we call optogenetics, which lets us control brain cells with pulses of light. And just this Wednesday, we published a paper um, announcing that we can start to image brain activity with high temporal precision across populations of cells in awake, behaving mammalian brains. But these are short talks, and I want to focus just on one main story. You can look up the other stories online. And this is the question of how do you make maps of the brain from molecule to cell to circuit to brain. Now, why do you want to do that? Well, of course, brain diseases are involving of alterations in how brain circuits are made of neurons with different wiring than you might want. And within those neurons, you can think of the neuron as a network of molecules. So how can you see how molecules are arranged in neurons and how neurons are arranged in networks and how these go wrong in disease states that we don't understand? How do you see those changes? Well, I think we've all seen pictures like this, MRI scans, where you can non-invasively see the brain, but these blobs or voxels that light up are very spatially uh, large. They can contain millions and millions of brain cells. And it's not good enough to see those cells one by one, much less the wiring and the molecules along those wires that make them do what they do. At the other extreme, you have microscopes, which are how brain cells were discovered in the first place over a century ago. But even they can't see very fine features because light has a finite size or wavelength, and you can't see things much smaller than that. So in our group, we started thinking, what if we do the opposite of what people have done for the last 300 years? Instead of zooming in on two cells, we can blow them up. And this builds from several ideas that go back several decades, including the study of responsive polymers. If you take the polymer found in baby diapers, for example, shown in this cartoon as white lines, and add water, shown in blue, osmosis draws the water in, the baby diaper polymer swells, and you get this hundredfold, thousandfold increase in volume. Importantly, these polymers are really tiny and spaced by very tiny gaps. So we started thinking in our group, what if you could take a specimen, form this polymer network throughout the specimen, weaving like a spider web these little polymer threads in between biomolecules, around biomolecules, inside of cells, around cells. Then if you add water and swell the polymer, could you blow up the specimen in an even way until like in this cartoon, we could take a brain cell like the golden one on the left, where the biomolecules are packed together too closely to see, looks like something on the right, where all the biomolecules are hovering like stars in a constellation in the, in the sky, but with a relative organization the same as in the intact state. So two biomolecules that are touching are now some minimum distance apart, and two biomolecules that are some distance apart have been scaled up by a linear factor. So how do you make this work? Well, we had to invent a lot of chemistries to make it work. And in this cartoon, you can see one of them. The brownish blobs are biomolecules, proteins in this case. 
And we had to invent handles that'll bind to the biomolecules and allow us to pull on them so we can move them apart from each other in an even way. And so we now have invented bi biomolecular handles that bind to different molecules like DNA and RNA and proteins and so forth. Then we have to weave that polymeric mesh. So we have a spider web permeating the brain. And we do that by a process called polymerization. We wash in so-called so monomers, shown as little white spheres, and they self-assemble into long chains, the very spider web-like mesh that we want. And when those little chains encounter the handles, they form a bond. So if you think about it, the polymer can expand, like I showed you before, with the baby diaper material being added water to. And now you can have a handle to convey the force. We add a softening agent, like detergents, in order to loosen stuff up. And then when we add water, the polymer threads will swell. But this time, because of the handles, the biomolecules will come along for the ride. So we call this technique expansion microscopy. In panel B at the top is a piece of the mouse brain before we expanded it. And then in panel C is the same piece of brain tissue, like a day and a half later, and we've blown it up until it's 100 times bigger. And because the polymer spacing is so tiny, the process is even down to the nanoscale, down, we hope soon, to the size of individual biomolecules, although we're not quite there yet, but we're heading in that direction. Here's a movie of a piece of the brain. It's been polymerized earlier, and just there we add water, and I hope you can see it swelling. So we're physically magnifying this piece of the brain. OK, so back to the original goal. We want to be able to image molecules across cells and cells across circuits, ideally throughout the brain, so we can pinpoint where diseases are treatable. What are the biggest changes that occur in different brain regions? What are the earliest changes that occur? And not just changes in where molecules are, but what they are. We want to really know what's happening in a comprehensive way. Because to be honest, we don't fully understand any brain disease, and we can't cure any brain disease fully. So one thing we're doing is color coding neurons. You can do this by taking proteins from jellyfish and corals and other species that glow, and you can put them into the brain in combinations using viruses, using tricks, tricks from the field of gene therapy. So here you can see an example of a piece of brain tissue where we're color coding the neurons with these jellyfish and coral proteins, expanding it. And I hope what you can see now is that we can start to really trace these circuits. And recently, just in the last couple months, we've been pushing on the machine learning front to develop algorithms that are optimized for the tracing of these color-coded and expanded brain circuits. Let's be a bit quantitative. And I'll use the mouse pointer, I think, if it'll let me. So this is a piece of the brain tissue uh, from the hippocampus, which is involved with many important functions, including memory formation. And you can see the beautifully color-coded neurons expressing different proteins. Let's just zoom in into one part here with the white box. And what you can see, I hope, is that you quickly get a blurry image if you zoom in, because again, light has a finite size or wavelength. So here you can see, for example, a green banana shape, unclear what we're looking at. But if you expand, you can now resolve one, two, three, four individual wires. And furthermore, you don't just have to image the wires. You can also see the molecules along those wires and at the connections. So we recently collaborated with Eric Betzig, who won the Nobel Prize for his own work in microscopy, and joined forces to come up with a strategy that lets us image about 1,000 times faster than the nearest equivalent resolution competing technique. And here you can see in this picture, the yellow is the fluorescent proteins filling the cells, but in magenta and blue are different proteins that are involved with neural communication, involved with synaptic exchange of information. And we can label them because we can buy tags off the internet that bind to these selectively and deliver them into uh, the specimen so we can label or color code these different building blocks of life. We can also bring other technologies in from other uh, fields of biology, for example, Sequencing is really important. We can bring sequencing technologies directly into these expanded tissues. So we're working with George Church's group, and uh, you can take a brain and expand it, and then sequence the genetic codes right there inside the piece of brain tissue. So you can start to map out where genes are expressed in the brain in a way uh, that lets you pinpoint them with extraordinary precision and also lets us go across these extended scales. So expansion microscopy, as we call it, is becoming really popular. New discoveries are being announced every week. It's really one of the most practical ways of doing 3D imaging with nano precision of molecules across scales. You don't even need any hardware um, beyond what you already have. I have colleagues here packing essentially cell phone cameras to try to detect pathogens. 
One of the big questions, though, is where do we go next? And so later today, actually at 2.30, uh, we'll have a little brainstorming session co-hosted by Sam Rodriguez, who, usually, who recently uh, finished a PhD in my group, to say what are the capacities here that could be enabled if we systematically map the brain? Could you really start to understand the nature of disease at a fundamental level? Because we can see all the different biomolecular building blocks across extended scales. So if you're interested in talking more about how to design organizations, systems, and strategies to make brain mapping into a truly routine thing, please join us later. So with that, I think I'll acknowledge all the people who contributed to this effort, far too many to list by name in such a short uh, talk, and thank you for your time. Thank you.